I thought I'd introduce you actually because I'm looking around going, there's quite a few people I don't know and you probably don't know me. I'm, my name is Esther. Um, I'm part of the leadership team here. Um, I'm married to James. Um, and we have three adorable children who are just scrummy all over. One's in, this, in the front row today. She, she gets the privilege of seeing her mum. Um, but yeah, so I'm a teacher. I work at the King's School, which in my opinion is the best school in the entire world. Um, I get to preach the gospel in my school. I get to um, pray with my colleagues. I get to worship. Um, and my children also benefit from being that school. While I'm not here to talk about the school, if you ever need to speak about the school to me, I'm always happy to speak about the school. Um, but I am making the transition from PE to RS this year, GCSE RS at that as well, which is pretty exciting. So this year is going to be full of um, exciting changes and actually for me personally, just a real delight to dig into what I'm teaching is uh, Judaism, Christianity and Mark's Gospel. So as a Christian, you can actually not go far wrong with that one really. So it'll be good. Um, I hope you've had a good summer. This summer we have been away at uh, Commission Festival, as you have, might have heard. That was a really precious time away to be with family. Um, and sorry that not all of you could be there, but um, can I encourage you to come along another time? Because they, they were moments for, for me as a mother to watch my children play with children, um, to worship together um, and to have a lot of fun. But also for me as a parent to have some time just on my own with God and to kind of really reflect on that time. But as a family, we were able to share in times of just chatting and eating together. It was just so wonderful um, to just have time as a church family. Um, and there'll be more opportunity for you to do that. And I'd highly recommend you coming along with us. But sadly, as um, Heather said, it is the start, the end of the summer holidays. Um, so youth, I know that you're in today. I'm sorry to say that it is time to go back to school. Um, sorry for teachers in the room who say it's time to go back to school as well. Um, but you might have had time to slow down. You might have had time to stop and reflect. You might have had time for adventure and fun. And um, whatever this summer holiday has brought you, today I want you to just pause before the start of a busy new academic year, or whether it is just the busyness and the run up to Christmas. Yes, I said the C word. Um, it is 113 days as well, by the way, so it's very exciting. Um, the teaching text I am teaching from is Psalm 119, which the next slide will show you how big this psalm actually is. And I'm interested actually to find out whether it's how small it is because I had to try and get it on one slide. Hopefully it's working. But if it does come up behind me, that's 119. Um, and it isn't, I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing because it does take about 20 minutes. There we go. Can anyone read that? Um, it's got 176 verses in it. Um, it's got um, lots and lots of goodness in there. So I'm not going to be able to read all of it, um, but I am going to look at the whole thing um, as a whole, and then I'm going to take the first two verses and start at the beginning, because that's a very good place to start, which reminds me of a song. Um, but we, so yes, we will find out in this epic um, chapter that there could be also 22 talks from this very easily and probably more so. So um, hopefully my talk is just going to give you a little taster for you to actually go away and read for yourself, um, which will be really good. So the two points I have is that devotion leads to um, beauty and devotion leads to blessing. So or reveals beauty and leads to blessing. So I start with a question. What are you devoted to? According to vocabulary.com, being devoted to something means being focused on a particular thing almost exclusively. When you are devoted to a cause, you work to achieve its goals. When you're devoted to a person, you place their needs above your own. Being devoted doesn't have to only refer to a personal relationships. It can focus on any area, activity or passion. So let me introduce you to a devoted couple. This is Herbert and Zelmira Fisher. Don't they look lovely? You would want some grandparents like that. They have um, a Guinness World Record for the longest marriage. Can anyone guess what their longest marriage Did it flash up? <laughs> Will, we talked about this. No, we didn't talk about it. OK, some, um, some things for us to guess. Can anyone guess? 80, 
six years and 290 days. They tied the knot when they were 18 and 16. Who would get married as a teenager? Um, for those of you who don't know, I did. <laughs> I got married as a teenager. I was 19 years old, though, so I feel like I'm you know, really old compared to them. Um, but can you imagine that? Any 16-year-olds in the room? Can you imagine walking down the aisle? No, no, it would be quite a scary thing. But when you know, you know. And clearly, um, Herbert and Zelmira Fisher knew. Their comment, when asked what would they change about their 80 years together, they answered, we wouldn't change a thing. There's no secret to our marriage. We just did what was needed for each other and our family. So cute. You do want to spend some time with them because they sound like they've dedicated their lives to each other and their family. It is wonderful. OK, so what about being devoted to a passion? Let me introduce you to Malcolm. Malcolm is, can anyone, oh, is it going? OK, Malcolm is, claims to be Britain's most dedicated football fan. Can anyone guess from there what kind of football, what football club he's part of? There we go, 10 points to you. P um, Piers Morgan, Philip Morgan. <laughs> um, yes, so he is a football fan um, and he is Bristol Rovers' fo biggest football fan and according to him, the, the world's biggest football fan. Um, so he has seen every one of his team home games for the last 50 years. And he said, Everyone has got their interest in life, and for me, mine is football. It has restricted what I can do at weekends during the season, but I can't complain. It's not felt like a sacrifice for me. I just love it so, mu so much. It is my life. <laughs> right. Or devoted to a job, and this lady does not need any introduction. Our dear late queen. She was true to her word when she, said, when she declared on her first televised Christmas broadcast in 1957, I cannot lead you into battle. I do not give you laws or administer justice, but I can do something else. I can give you my heart and my devotion to these old isles and to all the people of our brotherhood of nations. I wasn't going to do the Queen's voice then. Today, we look at what it's like to be a church devoted to the word. In an age where there is more distraction on socials with reels and shorts, I can't actually believe how much shorts and reels, if you know what I'm talking about, take up time. It, they are the most entertaining waste of time ever. Um, and I can't believe that actually the most of the time it happens, well, for me anyway, when I'm hiding in the toilet. Anyone else going to admit to that? They hide in the toilet with their phone, whether, it, yep, there we go, Do, kids dobbing you in. Um, so whether it's that actually you're looking at, you might not be looking at reels and shorts, don't look into it because it'll be a waste of time, <laughs> but they're really entertaining. Um, but it might be that you're into sports, into news, into Facebook, um, but that is, a time, that is something that feels like it is becoming more and more of a distraction to myself, and I'm fairly sure a lot of us in here. We are also in an age where increasingly work and family take top priority. Some, for, of the, some of the former outweighing the latter as well. Whether it's kids that are involved in every after-school club going, or it's just because we're working because we need to pay the bills. These in themselves are not bad things. But my point is, is that we're up against it with our time. So I want to ask the question, why should we be devoted to the word as a church? Is it necessary? Is it important for us, all of us who would call ourselves Christians? And what do you believe? In an article on the site Gallup, the studies have, they have put together say that 49% of Americans believe it's, the inspired, it's inspired by God, but not to be taken literally. 29% think it's a book of fables, legends, and history, and moral precepts recorded by man. While only 20% now believe that the Bible is the literal word of God or divinely inspired. In this church, we believe the Bible is divinely inspired. God spoke to the prophets and the apostles, and they wrote these words down. So it's not a hist historical record like a Winston Churchill's wartime speech rallying the troops and the nation to get behind us. Yes, that would be inspiring, but actually it's not appropriate for this time or useful for us today. 
The Bible is better than anything a historian could ever record. In this church, we believe that our God is eternal. Hebrews 4 verse 12 tells us that these words are alive and active, still valid and still in effect and changing hearts. Why? Because of the person who spoke it, God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we believe that God is eternal and alive, or alive, so not a statue or a fuzzy, warm spiritual feeling as we get into church, then we must believe that he still speaks to us today. And the primary way he speaks to us is right here. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells us a story about God's word being like a seed. The word, like the seed, is living. That when it's planted in fertile soil, it produces an abundant life. These words are living, alive, and active. And if that is true, then we have life in an abundance in our hands, whether it's on our phones or in, these, in this book, or maybe it's by your bedside table, or maybe it's in a box somewhere. The seeds of our faith need to grow. Otherwise, they will lay dormant and, dare I say, fade. I do just wonder if that's how you would describe your faith right now. Is it lying dormant? Is it fading? And if you were to say to me, I just don't feel like God's really speaking to me right now. Or it's just this problem that I have is, my question back to you would be, when did you last pick up this book? And then when you have picked up this book and got it in, then we can have a conversation. We have the opportunity to know God's character, to know his love for us, and plus with the added benefits of being a decent human being. God's words are still effective and powerful. Just admire what that means for us today as Christians. To have a life devoted to word does not come easy, but what in life does? A baby needs strength to walk. It doesn't just happen. They wobble and fall, but eventually they get the hang of it. GCSE pass grades don't just happen, do they? They take 10 to 12 years of study, starting with the basics in year R, with phonics and one plus one, to the challenges of year 11, which I'm not even going to try and go into. <laughs> You don't just walk into a job or start as a parent knowing everything. But by being intentional, along with trial and error, you start to understand more. It's the same way we approach the Bible. It requires us to start with the basics and then grow into the study and develop a spiritual strength that will last. And to keep trying even when we wobble and fall. We don't know everything, but by being intentional, we will start to understand more. As I've studied this chapter, once again, I felt challenged in my devotion and my time to give to it. This writer clearly loves um, this, this chapter, and we'll find out more about that in a minute. To be truly devo devoted requires sacrifice, just like Malcolm, who gave up his weekends to follow his football team, although he didn't see it that way. Or, just like Herbert and Zelmira, who self, in their selfless pursuit of each other, sacrificed their time to make their marriage work. What I, realized, what I have realized in studying these, this, sorry, what I've realized in studying the Bible is that to be willing to sacrifice my time and my effort, I actually have to first be in love. Malcolm loved his team. The fishes fell in love with each other, and the queen loved her country. All the things that pe these people have in common is love. To have a, love, a life of devotion, we have to first be in love with the one who is all about. I want to give us the opportunity to discover or rediscover 
the person who loved us first. That is Jesus. Because to be in love with Jesus changes everything. The psalmist, as we'll clearly see, had met someone he loved and in turn wanted to be devoted to. So let me introduce you or reintroduce you to our Heavenly Father. Read about him in this book. Ask God right now to reveal himself to you. Fall in love with the one who is already in love with you, who sacrificed his son on a cross all because he was devoted to you. And in turn, may we be challenged this morning to respond to this kind of love with our time, our attention and the sacrifice of our lives. There is no one here who has a perfect uh, relationship or devotional life with God. We are all distracted by the busyness of this life. But for those of us who try, for those of us who commit and who sacrifice, will have an abundant life. Do you know what? The Christian life is not smooth. God doesn't promise us that. He does promise he'll be with us. For me, life has thrown me another health curveball where I was for for years struggling with um, arthritis in my hip. I had an amazing um, hip uh, replacement and then it all went well and I've slipped over in time and then it's caused me more problems again, which is very frustrating and I'm very, very impatient with it. But I'm learning to be honest. And it's not easy at all. To, it's not, I'm not going to hide my weeping, but I'm also going to rejoice in knowing who my father is. And I'm going to call to mind the words that I have read. One of the, the verses that has been my strength, my, my prayer, my cry, has been that my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This is truth that I pray in those times of doubt, in those times of fear, in those times of disappointment and fed up. God, you will be my strength of my heart, even though I am in pain, even though I am struggling. You will be my portion forever. I am claiming that truth and I am not going to let it beat me. It gives me peace. It gives me hope. But the only reason I can do that is because I've read that in here. It doesn't magically just come to mind. We don't just have this epiphany that I think God says this. I mean, there are stories, don't get me wrong, but we won't go there today. But... To know that truth and pray that in the face of frustration, in the face of diversity, you first need to know what is in this. Let's commit to being a church that is devoted to the words that we overflow in abundant life. Our seemingly small acts of sacrifice will not just affect you and the closest to you, it will affect our communities, our city and our nation. Devotion reveals beauty. In this first part, I want to give us a glimpse of the whole chapter, like I said, to draw, um, to, to just give you a, a glimpse of it so then you can read it in your own time as well. Psalm 119 has been my favorite chapter throughout my adult years, my young adult years as well. So don't be put off by the size of it. That is something that I've worked through, prayed through, highlighted, crossed and not crossed, um, <laughs> pulled out and written down as a part of my prayer because I've realized the urgency in my life to consecrate myself to God again and again. And I want to achieve the same level of devotion as the author is describing. So let me introduce you to Psalm 119 now. The writer is unknown. And yet, the patterns of this psalm point to a very very similar style to David. Um, If he didn't write it, someone who wrote it, whoever wrote it, was just as passionate and obsessed with the Holy Scriptures as he was. I love how Psalm 119 has... Um, is ri- it's actually written for a Hebrew mind, and it's got patterns and word structures that would have been a feast for their souls. This need kind, this 
The need for this kind of food for our souls is highlighted by Jesus when he taught his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, give us this day our daily bread. The need for us feeding our souls is essential. And I hope this introduction into Psalm 119 as a whole will whet your appetite to read on for more. So if you want to know a few facts about 119, it's the longest psalm and it's the longest chapter in the whole Bible. It's in the alphabetical order of the Hebrew alphabet. And there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, which means that these sections are split up into 22 sections, um, all starting with one of the letters. And each letter follows eight verses. It is a song or an acrostic poem that is a commendation of God's word. And it's arguably the best acrostic poem ever written because of its intricate detail. Um, there's a few people who have like, commented on and done commentaries on Psalm 119. And some of the, the big names that we all know, what most of us would know, um, say this about this chapter. C.S. Lewis, who is an author of the Narnia series, said, This poem is not and does not pretend to be a sudden outpouring of the heart. It is a pattern, a thing done like embroidery, stitch by stitch, through long, quiet hours of the lo- for the love of Scripture and for the delight in leisurely, disciplined craftsmanship. I love how Charles Spurgeon, who is a powerhouse of a man, and as he comes up, you'll probably see, he is someone you definitely don't really want to cross. Um, He looks very quite serious as well. Um, He richly describes this pattern of Psalm 119 in this book, uh, in his book, The Golden Alphabet, as I admire the singular bend of testimony and prayer and praise in this psalm. In one verse, the psalmist bears witness. In the second verse, he praises. And in the third, he prays. It's an incense made up of many spices, but they are wonderfully mixed and work together to form one perfect sweetness. The blending increases the value of the whole. It's best to have all these divinely sweet ingredients intermixed and work together into sacred unity as you have them in this thrice hallowed psalm. It's a psalm, it's it's prayer bears witness, and its testimonies are fragrant with praise. Couldn't say it better than better myself. The psalm only focuses on one primary subject and yet has lots of secondary subjects to help us draw to the same conclusion as the writer to be devoted. In the same book, Charles goes on to describe this psalm as a kaleidoscope, the one where you put it to your eye and you look at different lights and twist it and it all has a pattern. Shift the lens in any direction or face it against a new light and it reveals another beautiful pattern or change of colour that looks equally as beautiful and the same and yet the same, but it isn't, which is just like this psalm. It speaks about the same subject and yet it isn't. The truth is the same, but presented in a new, fresh pattern that are equally as beautiful as the last. It's a psalm that keeps on giving. No human could write a piece so beautiful and a feast for our souls. It shows us the multifaceted words and thoughts of God are. As we move on from looking at the whole, I want to focus on the beginning of this chapter in verses 1 and 2. And we are going to discover that devotion leads to blessing. In verse 1 and 2, it says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. This is a very personal text. And it starts with a benediction which is a prayer asking for divine blessing. The writer is letting us know that there is blessing to be had for all those who follow this path. If we are reading, if we invest in reading in scripture, it will, we will not only discover just a good moralistic way to live, but we will discover the creator behind the words. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will develop a very deep and real soul connection that creates a relationship with God. The Christian life is not dry and boring. It's sometimes portrayed like that, right? I mean, who said they were going to church camp this summer? And what was their reaction? 
It's not always like, cool, that must be so fun. Most people go, oh, you've been made to go. That is the, what the world portrays, this Christian life. But no, it's not like that at all. It's one that is full of vibrant, it's vibrant and full of joy and so much excitement that can be found when there is love and sacrifice. If we are Christians who do not value the word as our daily bread, like in Matthew 6, we are missing a significant and fundamental part of our relationship with God. We are in a dangerous place of being tossed about, like it says in Ephesians 4 verse 14, with what the world suggests is a better way to live. One of the blessings in reading scripture is because it sanctifies us. When you become a Christian, you are justified because of Jesus, so you're born again. Through the shedding of his blood and the resurrection of his body, we are saved from our own sin and we can read scripture with the best intentions of keeping to it. The Christian life is a process of sanctification that sets us apart from the world. It doesn't just happen, but it's a lifelong journey, much like the psalm here is really long. It shows us that actually through this psalm, the writer has grown up. And while I mention growing up, I just want to take a little bit from the next section of psalms, where it says, how does a young person keep um, on a path? And it, by, by, it's gone from my mind. But it's by... by uh, by keeping, thank you, keeping to the word, that one. Being devoted to the word, that one, that's what I'm talking about. But yes, sorry. Yes, but by, a, so young people, what I want to say to you is that you are not too young to start reading the Bible. This is fully accessible for you, okay? Don't look at it as another piece of homework to do, but look at it as your daily bread. Look at it as something that you need for as you work out how to, to go out in this world. Just because you are young in age or you're young in your faith, it does not mean this is for you. But adults, we have the greatest influence in these young people's lives. If they can see us prioritizing time with God being, and being sanctified because adults don't get it right either. We all make mistakes. They will learn from our example and live in an abundant life too. So we need to make daily habits to get to know the scriptures so it can impact our lives. Sanctification is a process and, a de and devotion comes at a cost. But willingly surrendering and sacrificing our lives, we will see God glorified, and, uh, glorified in and throughout our lives. We must devote ourselves to God who has already done the most sacrificial thing with giving us Jesus. Then at the end of our lives, there is glorification where we are redeemed and released from all this sin and pain. It's wonderful. Looking around at the world though, it's pretty clear that the scriptures are telling us to live differently. We are to be an example to, work, to the world, not to pretend, not to present an idea of being perfect, but to reflect a God who is. He is a God who sees the imperfect and with his loving kindness is making us holy as we commit to him. Just touching on what I said about the scriptures being designed with patterns and structures um, in intricate details, I discovered a blessing that not only that, that a blessing not only is the start of this chapter, but it's the same pattern as David and Jesus. David starts the whole book of Psalms 1. One verse one: With blessed is the man who walks in who, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. I also found the same way that Jesus starts off his public ministry in Matthew five, where he talks about in the Beatitudes that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This kind of symmetry is not coincidence. It's the beauty. It's the beauty of the way this book is put together and is lined up and confirmed 
that the truth is, is sorry line up and confirm the truth that are so neatly and wonderfully interlaced into and throughout scripture if David, who is described as being the man after God's own heart, and Jesus, who is the son of God, and this writer are all telling us that there is blessing in being devoted to God, I think we have proof we need to take this life of devotion with a greater intention. This chapter in Psalms not only starts with one blessing, but a double blessing. A double blessing is something that should stir our souls and direct our minds to a lifelong ambition of being blessed by God. William Wilberforce, who was um, an MP, knew God's blessing in his life. In 1808, when he led the movement to abolish slavery, it took him 25 years to see this happen. And three days before his death, the House of Commons passed the law he'd been fighting for. Being a man of the word, he could clearly see that change needed to happen but he would never have been able to do that without knowing and having the confidence in what the scriptures say. Slavery was a money-making business for the rich, and it was the rich who ran parliament. From the scriptures, William could see that it was, this was not what God had intended and took a stand against the injustice at that time, and the majority would not have seen his point of view. Famously, though, he would recite the whole psalm to and from Parliament. Can you imagine that whole psalm from the beginning? It took him 20 minutes, and it was a 2.5 mile journey that he would take from, through Hyde Park all the way through to Parliament. This psalm shaped William Wilberforce's character, but he didn't just read and pray through scripture, he committed it to memory and recited it which would have helped him bring clarity in times of doubt, peace in times of disaster, and I'm sure joy as he praised God despite the difficulties. This is the blessing we can expect and more. If we want to make a difference in, the world, in our world of influence, whether that's for a decision being made for our nation, our workplace, or our home, we need to be a people who are like William Wilberforce. We need to read, we need to pray, and we need to learn the scriptures. To be able to recite them in times of difficulty so that we will overflow with blessing and reflect our Father to the world around us. We don't read the word to become Bible scholars, although we'd quite like to probably know it that, at that level, but we're not all Dave McNee, are we? But we also don't read it to learn and follow its moral ways, although we should do that too. We read the word to seek God himself. The Bible guides us into a life that is teeming with life and fullness. It brings us into a living relationship with, with a living God. The word strengthens and supports us in life when our hearts grow cold. Someone once said, since, the author of, since God is the author of life itself, his word has life-giving power both to bring spirit, the spiritually dead person to life and renew the believer. As we draw to the end, you will either agree with me or disagree with me. For those who disagree, we can talk later. But for those who agree with me, it's over to you. Like the saying says, you can draw a horse to water, but you can't make it drink to start of a new year, where normally, if it was a January new year, we'd be making New Year's resolutions. But the start of a new academic year, what, if we can all work on our devotion to God, what will you put in place this week or this month? Start at your level. Remember, babies aren't born walking. And a 16-year-old doesn't suddenly know their GCSEs. Bite-sized, manageable moments you can sacrifice to express your love for God will reap eternal and life-giving benefits. So what options are there out there? So there's obviously the Bible. You can read that. But there's also loads of apps and different things like that. At the moment, for me, this year, I've been reading Read Scripture on my phone app, but then I've also then gone to another Bible app to actually play what I'm reading. For me, that just works for me at the moment. I think I need both my senses to be focused, because otherwise I was falling asleep, to be really honest. 
So that's just a different way. That's not the way, but that works for me right now. Ask each other, what are you doing? How are you reading your Bible? Ask your parents, how do you read the Bible? Bible life groups are also an incredible way to learn what has been spoken about on a Sunday morning to then be pushed um, through, uh, so to then work through on a Wednesday night or Tuesday night. Those are times where you can grapple, you can wrestle, you can go, I don't understand. You can go, I don't believe this. They're the times where we talk about the Bible. Also, get to church consistently to hear the words and make notes so you don't fall asleep. Get together with people. When we first started the church, there was 20 of us. And that quickly grew to about 30, 35. And I was in my 20s, my young 20s. I probably was 22, I reckon. And what I realized, we were in a young church. And I was desperate to have someone mentoring me. And being a young church, you look around and go, we're all in the same boat. There's no one left to mentor us. So what I did, I, I asked someone I didn't know, which for those of you in this room, when I say this name, you will laugh because she actually turns out to be one of my best friends. Her name is Esther Clayton. So Esther, I didn't know at all. And in my heart, I went, I don't want to ask her because she's new and I don't know her. And then that start with two other friends actually became a really beautiful, strong friendship. All because we started with, I want to learn the Bible. Can I tell you that learning with people either you don't know will quickly make you very firm friends or finding people that you do know to go, let's do this together. This is what unites us. This is what we pray through together. Those are moments that you will look back on and go, I'm glad I invested. I failed to ask the question, why am I here? If you're not in love with Jesus, it's a lot of effort to get here on a Sunday morning. And to be honest, having f- breakfast in the sunshine with friends is a lot easier. So why are you here? Who is Jesus to you? You first need to be in love or rediscover why before you delve into devotion. You need to reset Sorry, you may need to reset. You may need to repent for the first time if you've not been a Christian, but you also may need to realize that actually you've drifted and you haven't prioritized the word. We get distracted by so much in life. Our phones, our homes, our family, our lives, our work. Church, let's rediscover our first love again. Jesus, our first love, Jesus, because that allows everything else to flow. We've got plenty of time, so don't rush off. Don't think you need to go and pick up the children right now. What I want is to give this time for us to worship and pray and seek God. We'll have a prayer team over there. If anything is just getting you, then you want to pray through with anyone, we will have someone over there to my left. Okay, but actually I want you to use this time just to stop and reset and go, where am I at? Do I, am I in love with Jesus? What am I doing here? Yes, I'm in love with Jesus. God, I want to pour out my whole life to you. I want to sacrifice my time and my energy to reading your word because I want to know you. In our pursuit to make this life the best it possibly can be, let's make God's word our priority. Like I said earlier, let's commit to being a church that is devoted to the word so that we overflow in the abundant life. Our seemingly small acts of sacrifice will not just affect us and those closest to us, but will affect our communities, our nations, uh, sorry, our cities and our nations. Okay, so as we just worship, let's seek God because he is worthy.